Hello. So we're going to continue on our work in probability and today we're going to be looking at relative frequency and expected frequency, which are two ideas that you have already dealt with in junior cert. So there's nothing really new today, we're just reminding ourselves of some language. And the definitions of these two things are on page 194 and 195 if you want to read their description or take down their version of the English. Now these are very intuitive ideas, both of them, and you'll see that when we do the questions. So I've written out the formulas, but you will have a better uh, chance of doing these questions if you simply think about what the uh, words are, what you intuitively would do in these questions. So for relative frequency, all it means is frequency is how often we see something. So the relative frequency of an event is how many uh, times we would get a particular outcome divided by the total number of outcomes. It's exactly the same idea as probability, it's just that it's written in an experimental setting instead of a more abstract or a logical setting like we have for basic probability. So it's exactly the same idea as probability, you do it exactly the same way, there is no difference between relative frequency and probability for all practical purposes. They're two different words for the same thing for most practical purposes. The second idea is uh, expected frequency. That's what we've got here. And the expected frequency formula can look quite weird and abstract, but if we just look at the English of it, it's not too bad. Frequency is how often we see something. Expected means expected. How often do we expect to see something? Well, what would that be? It would be how lightly the event is multiplied by uh, the number of times we're running the experiment or the trial. And we'll see this in practice in a bit. But the formula looks an awful lot more abstract than the idea actually is. Expected frequency just means how often do I expect to see a particular outcome. Now, let's get into some questions. Uh, on page 196, we're looking at question four to begin with. These questions in the book are a little bit out of order, so I'm going to do them slightly out of order. So we're going to question four, and Helen wanted to find out if a dice was biased. She threw the die 300 times. Her results are given in the table below. So what we have is, uh, just reading from the table, uh, the result one, so one on the die, came up. 30 times. So uh, when she threw the dice 300 times, 30 times she got a 1 on the die. So that's how we read our table. Now, part 1. For this die, calculate the experimental probability, which could also be called relative frequency, of obtaining a 6. So I go to my table and I look for er, uh, 6 as my outcome, and I got that 60 times out of a total of 300 times. So the relative frequency, which I usually call RF, is going to be 60 all over 300. Hopefully we're happy that logic is exactly the same as what we would have done for probability. If we hadn't been told there was any new topic going on, this is what we probably would have done. It's just the probability, the number of times we got a 60 out of the total number of times we ran the experiment. So what we're interested in divided by the total, exactly the same as probability that we've already worked through. Sorry, that was part A. And part B, we're asked for the relative frequency of getting a 2. So we go to our table and we see that we got a 2 40 times out of our 300 experiments. And when we put that in the calculator, we get 2 out of 15. Part 2. For a fair die, calculate the probability of the score. So now we're back to uh, probability as we've been dealing with it. So I will write it as probability. I actually skipped a bit. So this would be a uh, relative frequency of getting a 6. This is relative frequency of getting a 2. So I put 2 in brackets. 
Now, probability of getting a 6 for a fair die is just going to be 1 out of 6. Probability of getting a 2 on a fair die is also 1 out of 6. These are what we would expect for a fair die. This is what we're getting on this die. So the final part of the question asks us if the, bi the die we're dealing with is biased, and it is. So we said that a die is biased. That's our first block of marks. So the die is biased because our results are very different than in the theoretical probability. And the number of experiments is large, so it's 300. So biased as the number of experiments is large. So our result should be fairly accurate. 300 times is a reasonable amount of times to throw your die to figure out if it's biased or not. The number of trials is big. That's one point of information they're going to look for. Do I know that it running lots of trials is important for my experimental probability to be accurate? If I only rolled that die 10 times, I haven't done enough experiments have a good picture of what the probability uh, of each outcome is. Uh, and then outcomes have very different probability to expect it. So, in an exam question, what they're going to be looking for is, yes, the die is biased. The number of trials, and I know this because the number of trials is big, it's 300, uh, and I know it's biased because the outcomes are very different than what we would expect from the theoretical probability. So those are our three pieces of information for getting our blocks of marks for a question like question four, part three on an exam paper. Now, if we have a look back at question two on the same page, question two, we have our picture of our red marbles, white marbles and blue marble. And uh, one ball is selected at random from the bag shown and then replaced, this procedure is performed 400 times. So we have 400 trials in this experiment. And what is the probability of getting a red ball? So we are looking at our probability, probability of red. We have four red balls out of a total of eight. So our probability is going to be 4 out of 8, which simplifies to a half. Now, uh, part 2. How many times would you expect to select a red ball? So this is an expected frequency question. Sorry, that was part 1. This is an expected frequency question. But you don't really need the formula. How many times would you expect to get a red ball? Well, half of the time, sorry, I have a probability of a half of getting uh, a red ball each time I run the experiment. So it's going to be half of the time I would expect to get a red ball. So the expected for getting a red would be the number of times you ran the trial multiplied by the probability getting a red. Now this is the formal way of writing it, you need to be able to think this through, but if the probability of getting a red is a half, you run the experiment 400 times, half of the time you expect to get a red. So it's going to be 200. So let's write that down. It's going to be 400 multiplied by probability of getting a red is a half. So we expect to get a red 200 times when we're running our experiment. 
and that's all our expected frequency means. And then if we look at part B, that's part A, if we look at part B, we're asked for or the expected frequency of getting a white. And the number of times we run the experiment multiplied by the probability of getting a white. And what's the probability of getting a white? Is going to be 3 out of 8. We have 3 white balls out of a total of 8, so our probability is 3 out of 8. So our expected frequency is going to be 400 multiplied by 3 over 8. And when we put that into our calculator, we get 150. So we would expect to get 150 white balls when we are running this experiment 400 times. And that's all we have to worry about there. Now, the final question I'm going to talk to you about is question 9 on the next page. So 197. Question 9. It's a very quick question. All I'm doing is highlighting something important about our experiments to you which is simply what I already uh, mentioned here about uh, running our experiment 300 times. The more times we run our experiment, the more accurate a picture of the probability we get. And you're required to know that in an exam setting. So for question 9, we're asked, Paula records the number of sixes she gets when she rolls uh, a dice 10, 100 and 1000 times. The table below shows her results. Use this information to work out the best estimate for getting a 6 on Paula's di dice. Uh, give a reason for your answer. So the best probability best estimate of your probability is going to be uh, 165 all over 1000 because that is the most times the experiment was run. So we get a very poor picture of the probability of getting a 6 if we just did uh, our situation where she only ran the experiment 10 times. We get a slightly better picture if she just run the experiment 100 times and by the time she's rolled the dice a thousand times we have a pretty good picture of what the probability of getting a 6 is on her die. And when we put that into the calculator to simplify it, if we can, we get 33 all over 200. And again, we took the situation in where we had 165 sixes out of a total of 1,000 rolls because that was the largest number of experiments. that had been run. So this gives the best estimate of the true probability of getting a 6 on that die as the most trials done. So that's the only extra bit that you need to have in the back of your mind for an exam style question. The more times you run the experiment, the more accurate uh, our picture of the probability is said to be. And that's all we need for right now.